on the application of the Good Law Project and Electoral Commission Law and others. Yes, Mr. Paul. I'm pleased the court I appear for the learned duty, Mr. Jeremy Rothschild, for the appellant. My learned friends, this is just the Siegel Queen's Council, Mr. Tom Cleaver, appeared for the respondent. Those of the um, which were originally known as interested parties um, and have been participated in this appeal um, advised on the 17th of June that they are no longer represented or appearing in this appeal. And Mr. Darren Grimes, who was also named as an interested party, uh, didn't participate in the divisional court and isn't participating in this appeal. So it's just the two parties before the ladyship. Yes. There, just to go through the documentation, make sure we all have the same things. There's a core bundle, an agreed supplementary bundle, and a single bundle of authorities, which also has the legislation. We are going to be looking at the legislation in some detail. Yes. Um, I can forewarn you. There's, from the uh, respondents, an application notice. First, dealing with their skeleton argument, there's no issue about that. It's yes. Just, uh, page numbering. And the second is in relation to the, what's labeled the third supplementary bundle, which is probably the second, um, mm -hmm. with some extra documents. For our own part, we don't see how the court is going to be assisted by these, but I think the better approach is to listen to the submissions from the Electoral Commission, and you'll have a much better idea by the end of that. And indeed, so might my learned friend Weber, in fact, this is going to assist you yes. to look at this um, additional material. And that is, that, that is pretty much the same, or exactly the same, is it, as the unagreed supplementary bundle that we've been, we've been given? I think they're the self same things. Yes. Um, well, um, we, we rather take the same view. Um, we don't want to waste 20 minutes or half an hour sort of in, interlocutory skirmishing. Um, we'll we'll look at such documents as are drawn to our attention, and if they're helpful, they're helpful, and if they're not, they're not. Oh, great. From the appellant's perspective, there's one central issue uh, to be determined in the appeal, which we find in the uh, core bundle. It's, it was agreed with uh, both the before they exited from these proceedings. Um, the respondent puts it a little bit more widely. Uh, but just so that you see where it is, it's in uh, under tab 7, um, page 52 in the core bundle. It's quintessentially a point of interpretation. And it's a point of interpretation that falls to be answered by the 2000 Act, together with the modifications to the 2000 Act, which were affected by the EU Referendum Act uh, 2015. So, um, just to indicate to the court how I propose to structure my uh, submission subject to any direction. First of all, I want to run through the essential facts and the statutory scheme. Um, I forewarn the court, that's heavy going so far as the statutory scheme is concerned, but stop me if I'm losing um, your attention. Secondly, I want to point out the essential conclusions in the divisional court judgment below. Thirdly, I want to point out the flaws in that judgment and related to that the primary ground of appeal. So that's what we say was a misreading by the Divisional Court of the phrase expenses incurred and that's as used in section 111 subsection 2 of the 2000 Act. And as part of that I will be illustrating some of the ramifications of that and I should point out that that phrase expenses incurred is used dozens of times peppered throughout different provisions of the 2000 Act. So it yes. has important consequences for the body administering the Act, the Electoral Commission. And it's got a long history as well. It has a long history indeed. It, it dates, you, you'll find it also in the representation of the People Act and then all of the uh, re, earlier uh, reenactments of that provision. The fourth um, stage is what we say is the correct approach. Then I'll deal very shortly with a secondary ground of appeal, 
the secondary ground of appeal is that even if even if the divisional court were correct to characterise the payment by vote leave of 620,000 odd to AIQ as both expenses incurred by it, i.e. by vote leave, we say the payment was nevertheless not a referendum expense because looked at from the perspective of vote leave, it was a payment incurred in respect of a donation to a permitted participant, that permitted participant being, of course, Mr. Grimes, and not in respect of any of the matters uh, listed in Part 1 of Schedule 13 of the 2000 Act. Now, once I've done those five stages, that deals with most of the points that are raised um, in the respondent's skeleton, but there are some uh, mop-up points that I need to deal with that I'll deal with at the end. So I turn then to the first stage, the essential facts and statutory scheme. And the facts themselves can be very shortly stated. The scheme, the statutory scheme, like all electoral uh, legislation, is highly prescriptive. And that is commonplace in electoral legislation because the draftsman is very anxious to ensure that everything is dealt with in unambiguous terms. So whether it is the returning officer under the Representation of the People Act, whether it is the Electoral Commission in this Act, or whether it is another electoral office, officer, they all need to know exactly what they have to do, when they have to do it, and how they have to do it. So that when there's tussle between the two competing, three competing candidates for uh, campaigns. They aren't seen as being partisan. They're simply administering the legislation. And you can't have, so far as is possible in electoral legislation, any scope for ambiguity. And that is why you find thousands of pages, it's not an exaggeration, there are thousands of pages of electoral legislation dealing with what is in most circumstances, a very short period, usually six weeks, together with the four weeks after the declaration of the result. It's an attempt by the draftsman to make sure that those administering its provisions know exactly what they have got to do and that there is no ambiguity. And we'll see the importance of that for the purposes of this appeal. Because what we say has been introduced by the provisional court is that sort of ambiguity, is that sort of evaluative judgment. Uh, which the legislation sets its face against. So the principal part of the uh, 2000 Act with which we are concerned is Part 7, comprising um, sections 101 to 129, and you will find that in your bundle of authorities um, under Tab and in the, in the bundle it's paginated sequentially so it's, the act starts at uh, page 47 you can see the architecture of the act from the table of provisions you turn to page 52 part, sorry 51 you see part 7 is headed referendums and it comprises a set of provisions that spell out what those participating in one way or another in a referendum must or may do during the course of a referendum. Put very broadly, the objective of the provisions is to ensure the orderly conduct of referendums, to require the protagonists for any of the outcomes to be open about their funding, and their expenditure, and to limit the latter, to limit their expenditure. Part 7 of the 2000 Act does not of itself mandate referendums. It's concerned with certain aspects, important aspects, of the machinery of the referendum, or the conduct of the referendum, regardless of what the referendum question might be. The mandate for the 
2016 EU referendum came from the EU Referendum Act 2015, and that the court has under tab five. Tab three. Sorry, tab three, I apologize. Um, and this act, like other acts that mandate a particular referendum, dovetails with the 2000 Act and engages with it. And we see in section one uh, of the 2015 Act that the referendum was to be held and that the UK should remain a member of the EU. Under subsection two, the Secretary of State must, by regulations, appoint the day on which the referendum is to be held and then there were limits on when that day could be. <coughs> the date was set by, and we don't need to look at this, the European, European Union referendum, date of referendum regulations 2016. Uh, and that prescribed the date of the 23rd of June 2016. That date, that setting of the date, set the clock ticking for various legislative provisions governing the conduct of referendums, including the provisions of Part 7 of the 2000 Act. Then, to pick up something in the 2015 Act, which is going to assume great importance, critical importance for this appeal, you'll see on the first uh, page the reference to Schedule 1, Campaigns and Financial Controls. We'll look at this in more uh, detail later on. But uh, Schedule 1 starts at page 182, and runs on for a good number of pages, and you'll see throughout what it does is it effects either amendments or inserts additions or creates deletions from the 2000 Act. In practical terms, what this means is that whenever one is considering a provision in Part 7 of the 2000 Act for the purposes of the EU referendum, you've got to check this schedule to see whether any modifications were made to that provision for the purposes of the EU referendum. So you start, you have in one hand your 2000 Act, and then you're always looking at Schedule 1 for the purpose of the EU referendum to see what changes have been effected. And we'll see how important that is for this appeal in a moment. But returning to uh, Part 7 uh, under Tab 2, uh, broadly speaking, it deals with five aspects of the referendum process. It deals with who are what are termed permitted participants in a referendum. Secondly, it defines what are referendum expenses. Thirdly, it sets out financial limits on referendum expenses. And that's limits both by permitted participants and others. So different limits are set for different classes of people. Fourthly, it specifies requirements on donations to permitted participants. So it's not just money out, but money in to permitted participants. And finally, fifthly, it sets out reporting and return requirements by those who are permitted participants. So there's a reporting aspect at the end of the process. And that again is very important because what's happening is those reports posted up on the Electoral Commission's website and people can see how much has been spent, where the money has come from and so on and so forth. And as I've said, one of the main objectives of Part 7 and indeed other provisions in the 2000 Act is to ensure public transparency uh, for those who are permitted participants, uh, and particularly, particularly in relation to their funding and the source of their funding but also to ensure a fair playing field for those who are participating by ensuring that there are caps set on how much they can spend. 
Now, for the EU referendum, there were a total of 123 permitted participants. Of the 123, 60 favoured answering the referendum question that the UK should leave the EU, and the remaining 63 favoured answering the referendum question that the UK should remain a member of the EU. Under the 2000 Act, in a referendum for which there are only two possible outcomes, and you can have a referendum theoretically that has more than two outcomes, but in a referendum such as this, for which there are only two possible outcomes, the Electoral Commission can designate one permitted participant as most widely representing those campaigning for one particular outcome, and then may designate another permitted participant as most widely representing those campaigning for the other outcome. This is important because each of those designated uh, permitted participants becomes then what is known as, quote, a designated organisation. So if you had 20 in a referendum, 10 seeking one, 10 seeking the other outcome. The Commission may designate <coughs> one um, in favour and one against. And that's done by Section 108 of the 2000 Act. The page number in your bundle is 10, sorry, 140. There's an application process which you see in Section 109. And then a decision is made by the Electoral Commission. Now, the significance of that, in general terms, is that being a designated organisation means that the spending limits on referendum expenses are considerably increased. Secondly, <coughs> designated organisation is entitled to a grant of financial assistance up to £600,000, and you see that in section 110, subsection 2. It also means that the designated um, organisation has certain rights um, to use rooms, to make broadcasts, and so on and so forth. So it's given, by virtue of that status, um, a certain amount of apparatus to assist it in being the lead campaigner for a particular outcome. But with that comes a certain amount of added responsibility, which we'll see in a moment. In the EU referendum, vote leave, that's the interest of party, was permitted participant within the meaning of the Act, and as the name rather suggests, it sought a referendum outcome that the UK should leave the EU. Vote Leave was also the designated organisation under Section 108, and that feeds through into the 2015 Act. It became the designated um, organisation for that Act as well. So that's Vote Leave, permitted participant plus designated organisation. Mr. Grimes, who we will hear about, Mr. Darren Grimes, was also a permitted participant in the EU referendum. He too was in favour of a vote that the UK should leave the EU. So that meant that he and Vote Leave were campaigning, of course, for the same outcome in the referendum. Next, if we turn to section 118, which is at page 146, um, you'll see that gives effect to Schedule 14, <coughs> which is at page, 100 and, start to page 170, and that sets limits to referendum expenses incurred by or on behalf of a permitted participant. So that is applicable both to both Leave and to Mr Grimes, um, during the referendum period. 
Now, for the purposes of the uh, EU referendum, those limits were, like so much else in the 2000 Act, modified, and you see that in paragraph 25 of Schedule 1, the page reference is 188, see there in the middle of that page it's substituted the figures, that's paragraph 25 subparagraph 2 so they've upped the numbers from 5 million to 7 million, 7 million is for the designated organisation um, and for Mr Grimes the limit was 700,000 he was under subparagraph Roman, small Roman 5 The nomination of the 23rd of June 2016 as the date of the referendum had the effect of defining what is termed the quote referendum period. And for the purposes of working out what is meant by the referendum period, if you turn to section 102, subsection 3, which is at page 138. directs you to the EU Referendum Act, then if you go to the EU Referendum Act, paragraph 1 of Schedule 1, you'll see that that leads it to a statutory instrument, and the statutory instrument to which I previously referred to the court, <coughs> um, number 278 of 2016, provided that the referendum period began on the 15th of April 2016. Sorry, this statutory instrument number was? Sorry, uh, 278 of 2016. Is that in the bundle? Uh, no, it is not in the bundle. Um, I can arrange for a copy to pass it up during the, after the short adjournment, if that's helpful. Speaking for myself, I Yes, it would be helpful. helpful. Okay. Um, so, and that's Regulation 4. So, referendum period begins on the 15th of April 2016. And it ends with the date of the referendum itself, so that's the 23rd of June, giving us a period of 10 weeks. So we've now got the protagonists. We now know what the, obviously know what the referendum date is, and we know what the referendum period is, and we know also what the limits are for different classes of committed participants. We turn then to uh, consider Part seven um, of the two, th sorry, part, yes, part seven of the two thousand Act, starting at section one zero one. It's page one hundred thirty seven. Yes, page one hundred thirty seven, and um, <coughs> we'll see um, it describes referendums to which the part applies. We've already seen and considered the referendum period, section one zero two. The date of the poll we know. The referendum question, looking at section 104, that was sent by the 2015 Act, the EU 2015 Act, section 104. Then next, section 105 deals with permitted participants. Um, and again, there are spoke amendments to that effect by paragraph 2 of Schedule 1 to the 2015 Act, but nothing to... Not material. No, not today. material. Um, then, Section 106 deals with the formal requirements for a registered political party or an individual body to notify the Electoral Commission uh, that it is a permitted participant in the referendum. And again, there are some bespoke amendments to this uh, provision, but they're not material for present purposes. And you can see in section 106, subsection 3, that when a person notifies the Commission that they are a committed participant, they must indicate the outcome for which that person proposes to campaign. And, of course, they've got to give their full name and address. <coughs> then, over the page, page 140, 
we see that the uh, Commission is under a duty to maintain a register of all declarations and notifications under Section 106. In other words, a register of, of the persons and bodies that are permitted participants. No bespoke amendments to Section 107. And we keep our hand here because we're going to go through this sequentially. We just jump for present purposes to Section 149, which is at page 154. We see that the Section 107 register must be made available for public inspection during office hours. And in practical terms, the Commission registers are kept electronically and are accessible via the internet. And that feeds back to the point I made about the whole thing being transparent and accountable to the public. So the public know what's being done, as it's being done, who the committed participants are, what they're campaigning for, and so forth. That requirement, sorry, the, the, that, that practice that it's on the internet, is that a requirement of any legislation or delegated legislation or a code or anything like that? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I may be correct. Yeah. Don't take time over it now. Uh, but th this kind of provision, making a copy of a register available for public inspection, of course, is very commonplace in many acts and, and goes back probably decades, if not centuries. And in the old-fashioned way, it would have been that a local authority, for example, would hold uh, a, a paper copy in its offices and people could go, go along and see it. But obviously nowadays what you're telling us is that people expect to see it yes. on the internet. As indeed in other spheres indeed. of governmental activity, you can yes. see planning registers and what have you. But very much so with the registers of the commission, they are up there for people to see. Uh, and understandably so, we've got to move with the times. Um, so returning then to the provisions, um, page 140, sections 108 to 110 deal with the designation of organisations. Um, and I've already introduced the concept of the designated organisation. Uh, again, there were um, amendments effective to these provisions by paragraphs 9 down to 13 of Schedule 1 to the EU Referendum Act. But I think I've said what I need to say in relation to the designated um, organisations, the fact that they can get assistance and they can use rooms and so on and so forth. The next suite of provisions, <coughs> uh, which is Chapter 2, um, Sections 111 to 124, deal with financial controls of referendum expenses. And fundamental to these uh, provisions is an understanding, um, or is the definition rather, of referendum expenses, the very provision with which we are concerned in section 111, subsection 2. Uh, no amendments made to this uh, provision by the 2015 Act, uh, but reduced to its core, it means expenses incurred by or on behalf of an individual or body, which are expenses falling within Part 1 of Schedule 13 and incurred for referendum uh, purposes. Now, to unpack that, uh, keep our hands on this page and turn to Section 160, which is at, starts at page 155. We see there that the word body, without more, means a body corporate or any combination of persons or other unincorporated associations. So as broad as could be. I'm so sorry, I, I didn't catch up with you. Which page are you on? Uh, 155. Oh, I did catch up with you, sorry. 155, general interpretation it, yes. is the third definition body. Yes. And the point I made there is body is defined to be incorporated or unincorporated um, or any combination of persons. So when we return to 111, um, we see um, what that uh, signifies. It may not matter, Mr. Cockrell, but 
On the face of it, that definition, I take it, would be broad enough to include a political party. Um, depending, yes, depending on how, it's, well, yes. Um, it, it, on its words, it could, but, it, but am I right in understanding that, in fact, the legislative scheme is to draw a distinction between individuals, bodies, and registered parties? Correct. Then we turn to Schedule 13, um, and because that's, of course, picked up um, in the definition, and Schedule 13 is page 168. And divided into uh, two parts. It's the first part we're concerned with. And what it says is that for the purposes of section 111, subsection 2, the expenses falling within this part are expenses incurred in respect of any of the matters set out in the following list. So the list of matters is there. These are the things um, which are brought into uh, section 111, subsection 2. But then there are some exclusions in paragraph 2. And running one's eye down that list, uh, see what's included and what, it, what is excluded. And it's, uh, understandably enough, fairly widely drawn. There are some modifications to this list by paragraph 19 of Schedule 1 to the EU Referendum Act. And then going back to our definition, um, we see that it must be incurred for, quote, referendum purposes. And that term itself is defined in subsection 3 of section 111, again in fairly predictable terms. So that's the definition of referendum expenses and the different elements of it and how it picks up different provisions. We turn then to, over the page, uh, to page 143, uh, section 113. This prohibits the incursion of any referendum expenses by or on behalf of a committed participant unless it is incurred with the authority of the responsible person. The responsible person is defined in section 105, subsection 2. And the effect of contravention is to expose the responsible person to a civil sanction, and that's imposed by section 147 together with the provisions in schedule 19C. Sorry, can I have those references again, if you don't yes, mind? Yes, certainly. So the... Uh, it's responsible person yep. defined section 105, okay. subsection 2. Thank you. Effect of contravention and the civil sanction is section 147, which brings into play schedule 19C. Capital C. Capital C, yep. Charlie. Yep. And it also exposes the responsible person to criminal prosecution. That's section 113, subsection 2. And what one gets from all of that is an underscoring of the importance um, of a committed participant faithfully recording the amount that it incurs by way of referendum expenses. I'm conscious of the fact I've only started in a sense going through my... I've got a reading note, if that helps, to, to save people. Well, it might, if, if you've got copies of it available, then I suspect it would help us enormously. Right. If you haven't got them I'm available now, then perhaps they could come. I'm writing a lot. I've got some... I may promise that I won't go off the piece. No, but it, um, may, it may enable you to take, to take the statutory provisions a little more quickly if we have it in front of us. Um, and in there, let's see where I'm up to. I'm up to the foot of page two. You'll see I've just referred to the provisions there. That's uh, 2910. So the, um, as I've said, um, 
what it does is it puts a, a, a premium on the faithful recording of amounts. And one understands, <coughs> of course, why that's has, has Miss Simon got a copy of yes. the note? Yes. Good. Yeah. Um, the next provision is section 114, and uh, this ties in with the uh, prescription of payment of referendum expenses by or on behalf of a permitted participant, other than by the responsible person or someone authorised by a responsible person, and it requires that payments be vouched by an invoice or a receipt. And again, there's a criminal sanction for non-compliance. Then 115, uh, foot of page 143 of the bundle, deals with the situation where a third party uh, supplies a permitted participants with goods or services during the referendum period, but then delays payment for those services. So one can see what's going on here, is an attempt to circumvent the provisions. So under section 115.1, unless the claim is submitted to the responsible person within 30 days after the end of the referendum period, it ceases to be paid. So that's the great impetus for not um, engaging in that um, uh, technique. Um, and so what happens then is this enables the responsible person to deliver the return listing all of the referendum expenses um, incurred by or on behalf of the permitted participant within the time limit prescribed by the Act. Now the time limit is either three months or six months depending on uh, the organisation itself. And we see that um, put at page 147 in section 122. We're going to look at what those is concluded in those returns because again that is critical for this appeal in a moment. So that's that provision. Then returning to uh, the sequence, section 116, deals with disputed claims of payment. We're not concerned with that. Uh, section 117 deals with expenditure by bodies or individuals that aren't permitted participants, and they are limited to £10,000. So if you're, not, if you're not going to, as it were, go by the reporting requirements, then the amount that you can spend is capped at £10,000. And that wasn't modified for the purposes of the 2016 referendum. Then section 118, we're now on page 146, in conjunction with schedule 14, which is at page 107, uh, sets a limit on the amount of referendum expenses that may be incurred by or on behalf of a <coughs> permitted participant. We've already looked at that and how that, those limits were changed for the EU um, referendum. That's the uh, 7 million uh, figure for the designated organisation for both League and uh, 700,000 for Mr Grimes. And we'll see how that's, uh, we can see how that's all uh, worked out. So, just pausing here, as I've indicated when I mentioned if you spend over £10,000 referendum expenses. The quid pro quo for all of the reporting responsibilities and exposure to criminal sanctions um, that registration as a permitted participant brings is the ability to spend above the £10,000 limit up to, in the case of a designated organisation, £7 million. Um, so that's the way that the scheme works. Um, and we've already seen what those limits were. You say that, Mr. Carpool, but it may be significant that the words Parliament has used are not simply incurred by permitted participants, but also on behalf of. They are significant. So uh, and we'll see what that significance is for the purposes of the appeal. And one of the points we make why we say the divisional court uh, went astray in relation to all of this. And we'll see how it fed through into a confusion of the reporting requirement. What animated the policy consideration that animated uh, the divisional court's decision was in fact already accommodated, as we will see, 
by the reporting requirements. There's a slight um, hypothetical element to this whole appeal. Because as we will see when we look at their judgment, they proceeded on the footing that these weren't what are called common plan expenses. Permission was refused on that ground on the basis that it was all factual. Yes, and in fact, as it's happened, as things have moved on since then, they have been found to be common plan expenses. So, in a sense, what the court has before it is something which has been overtaken by history. However, because the decision has uh, huge ramifications for the Electoral Commission, we can't let it stand. No. Um, and hence my point about it's not just this provision that deals with expenses incurred. There are dozens of provisions in this Act, and there are dozens of provisions in the RPA. So, but but uh, just, just, just to put down one or two markers, um, expenses incurred by or on behalf of have to be reported by the, um, uh, the, the committed um, participants. So a classic example of that might be that um, a donor says, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for the hire of your rooms or something, or I'll provide you with, with um, transport. And so those expenses would have been incurred on behalf of the, the, the permitted participant. And uh, just, just if I can finish the thought, um, those um, would, would be, uh, would not be subject, would they, or would they, to the 10,000 limit? The 10,000 limit is not going to apply to a committed participant. No, no, no. But it's but going to be those who are not committed participants. Yes. If I give the paradigm examples, you might have an action or a referendum. You might have an agent who's doing a lot of work uh, for the campaigner and you, you, the campaigner, say to the agent, well, sort this out for me, sort that out for me, incur this expense, incur that mm. expense. Anything incurred by an agent for or on behalf of a committed participant is going to be brought home to the participant. You can't have a dozen agents. Um, so it's and the way it's dealt with in the Act is an authorisation by the responsible person, that's the office holder. So that's the way that it's dealt with. And, and will we be looking at a moment at the, um, at the donation provisions? We will. Uh, provisions. Just well, now. I'll, I'll come uh, back to the, fact, to the, to um, the, the thought that I need the some help with. The point I make here is that quite separately from the control over expenses, so what I previously characterised as money out. Um, there's another reporting regime in relation to donations to committed participants, what you might call money in. And that is imposed by section 119, which we see at page 146, which of course engages schedule 15, which we see at page 171. And although in this appeal, we are directly concerned with the reporting of donations. It is important, as part of the backdrop to this appeal, <coughs> if we turn to Schedule 15 regime is that they have their own regular reporting regime um, under section 62 and schedule 6 of the Act. We don't need to look at that, but they've got a regular um, reporting regime of their own. This is for those who are committed participants that aren't um, registered political parties other than minor parties. We see here in 1.4 uh, the definition of relevant donation 
in relation to a committed participant. It means a donation to that participant for the purposes of meeting referendum expenses incurred by or on behalf of the committed participant. So there again is the definition. And that dovetails with the referendum expenses definition we were looking at, section 111, subsection 2. In crude terms, money received by a committed participant gets recorded under the Schedule 15 regime, whereas money spent by a committed participant gets recorded under the Schedule 13 regime and the related provisions. We don't need to, and we don't have the time to look at the detail of the donations scheme, but it's enough to observe it's very detailed, and all of the relevant donations have to be recorded in the uh, committed participants' return. There were a number of amendments affected to Schedule 15 for the purposes of the EU referendum, and one of these is important. It's um, paragraph 39 of Schedule 1 of the 2015 Act, you have at page 193. <coughs> and what it effectively did for the purposes of the 2016 referendum was impose a weekly reporting requirement <coughs> in relation to donations received by a committed participant. And again, there's an exemption for registered political parties because they have their own reporting rate. Regime. Now, again, the significance of that is this is, a, in a sense, reporting after the event, weeks, months after the event. It's regular reporting, gets posted up um, by the Electoral Commission um, on its website. The other, while well, we're at um, Schedule 1, important provision is paragraph 41 at page 194. This underscores the point that I've just made. And this provides that the donation report that a committed participant is obliged to deliver on a weekly basis to the Commission has to be made available for public inspection as soon as practicable after receipt. So what it means is that during the campaign, people can track donations, the amount, who's making them, to each of the committed participants. Now, um, I've already noted, of course, the referendum period ends with the date of the referendum, the 23rd of June. And with the end of the referendum period, the clock begins to tick for the preparation and submission of the various returns by committed participants. And here we turn to is for the purposes of this appeal a very important provision in the 2000 Act, section 120 at the foot of 146 on page 147. And what this does is this um, requires the responsible person for a committed participant to make a return in respect of various matters we see enumerated in subsection 2. So a statement of all payments made, a statement of all disputed claims, a statement of all unpaid claims, and um, various, uh, in the case of a committed participant, either is not a registered party or is a minor party, a statement of relevant donations, that's paragraph D. Um, Important amendments were made to section 120 by the EU Referendum Act. We keep our hand on 146 and then turn to schedule and it's uh, page 187, paragraph 23. What it does is it requires further declarations to be made. So it's not just statements that we've seen in subsection 2 
of the 2000 Act, the declarations under subsection 4A and 4B, and then 4A and 4B are set out at the foot of that page together with um, interpretation of provisions 4C to 4B. We'll look at these in more detail in a moment. But essentially what's being done here is make an obligation or impose an obligation in respect of common plan expenses. So when you've got common plan expenses, it's not enough simply to have a statement of all your payments. You've also got to have, and to have separately, declarations of your common plan expenses. And we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, but the again, the point I make here is that the policy consideration which animated uh, the decision of the division of the court was fully satisfied by these separate provisions dealing with common plan expenses. Because of the way the case was constituted in front of the division of the court, whilst it did consider these provisions, they tended to be put on the side. So, um, paragraph 9 of Schedule 15 to the uh, 2000 Act, which is at uh, page 175, imposes a separate requirement to include a statement of relevant donations. Remember, we were looking at Schedule 15 before. <coughs> so the Section 120 statement is not simply concerned with payment, it's also concerned with statement of relevant donations. But having made weekly statements of donations during the course of the referendum period, once the period has ended, ended with the referendum, the admitted participant must then include in the post-referendum return a statement of all relevant donations it received during the entire period. And the details are set out in 10 to 11. Where the total amount of referendum expenses exceeds 250,000, so a significant amount, we return to page uh, 147, section 121. The, there's a higher requirement, great spending, higher requirements. The return has to be prepared by a qualified auditor. And the auditor, importantly, has a statutory right of access to all the books, documents, and other records of a committed participant and can interrogate the officers. And that's in section 44. And again, it's important because it makes clear that where referendum expenses have exceeded this particular threshold, there's a higher requirement to ensure that the return which are being submitted is submitted independently by an individual with coercive powers to ensure the accuracy of, of what is uh, put. I don't, want, forgive me, you finish, I don't want to take you out of turn at all. But at some point, could, could you help at least me in your submissions? We have to recall that this has got to be understood and applied in real life by, for example, the individual who may be affected by the act. Um, but th th does the submission you just made about the £250,000 limit assume that the individual knows that they've incurred expenses of more than £250,000. Because if you didn't know, then how is the auditor going to get involved? Well, um, as soon as an individual uh, records him or herself or itself as a permitted participant, yes. there is um, great freedom on that individual body in terms of the amounts that it can spend. But as I indicated at the outset, with that greater freedom comes greater responsibility. Um, and as you go up in the amount that you can spend during the referendum period, so too becomes greater the responsibility on the shoulder of the committed participant. Basically, this is uh, I understand not that. parameters. Um, oh. 
will. It, it has to be dealt with um, if you are a committed participant. Responsibly, you have to understand uh, your obligations, and that's the quid pro quo for the greater freedom, if you are to be a committed participant. Um, well, section, section 120 requires production of, um, of invoices and matters of that sort, and so the, the, the underlying assumption is that anyone in this position will be uh, keeping those records yes. of um, the expenses being incurred um, directly or on their behalf, or one, uh, we perhaps don't need to look at them, the rather more complicated provisions that relate to um, gifts and, and provision of services that are an undervalued, if I can call it that. All of this has a, 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 a record-keeping requirement. It does, and it has, of course, it's analogue in the election process for candidates keeping records of expenses and what have you. It's the way that the legislation has ensured basic uh, openness in the process, finding out who's, what participants, where are they getting their money, how are they expending. Whereas the donations themselves, the donor is obviously doesn't need to report that. It's the recipient of the donation. It's the spender of the money that has, as the committed participant or the registered party, the obligations imposed on them to be accurate, to keep records, uh, and to make careful decisions. And as I said, once it's over 250,000, to get somebody independent uh, to carry out that exercise. I, mean, I take the point. Um, you've got to know where it is or it isn't before you get to the 250,000 pounds. But um, response to that is that if you're anywhere near it, um, it's sensible to get somebody independent to say, am I over it or not, to see whether I have this obligation to meet. So the returns themselves um, after the referendum must be delivered to the uh, commission within six months um, of the date of the uh, referendum in the case of an order to prepare one, three months, if it doesn't have to be by law to that section 122. It's got to be vouched in terms of its accuracy by a responsible person. And then again, we see in section 124, as soon as practical after receiving the return, it's got to be made available for um, public inspection. And in the case of donors, um, the uh, addresses are redacted. And they've got to be kept available for at least uh, two years. So that um, completes the survey of relevant provisions and um, then returning to the basic facts and as I've indicated previously, um, in certain respects important facts for the uh, divisional court were on this assumed basis and subsequently some of those uh, assumed facts have not been out. And the critical one, the critical assumed fact before the divisional court was that none of the expenses was what is called a common plan expense. And I'll come in a moment to what is meant by a common plan expense and its significance. But if we pick up the judgment of the divisional court in the core bundle under this is from the All England Law Reports. Turn to paragraphs 29 down to 32. We see the heading common plan expenses. And it's critical to an understanding of the divisional court uh, judgment. Paragraphs 31 to 32, and we see that the issue of whether the expenses were common plan expenses wasn't before the court. Essentially, what happened, effectively, what happened was that the divisional court heard the case on the assumed basis that the referendum expenses it was considering were not common plan expenses. And so the question before it was, on that assumed basis, by whom 
were the referendum expenses incurred. And uh, I didn't appear below, but there is a certain element of unreality, if I may say so, in that assumed basis, given the other facts that were before the court. But that is the way that it was done, and that is the way uh, that this appeal must be dealt with. Because, as we have seen, Vote Leave was a permitted participant, was also the designated organisation for the Leave outcome. And as I've indicated, the net effect of that was that the referendum expenses that it could incur for on its behalf were limited to seven million. Mr. Grimes, a limited participant seeking the same outcome, was limited to seven hundred thousand pounds. Now, to further complicate matters, Mr. Grimes had a campaign name called B Leave, B E L E A V E which he used during the campaign, had no uh, personality, but we've seen could nevertheless have been a permitted participant. Uh, but it was Mr. Grimes, not B. Lee, who was the permitted participant. There are no limits on the donations that can be made to a permitted participant. What matters, so far as donations are concerned, is that they are reported weekly, and then at the end of the referendum period in the term that I've spoken to. What happened during the EU referendum was that by the 9th of June, that is to say well before the uh, date of the referendum, it became apparent to vote leave that with a forthcoming promised donation of a million pounds, it was going to have received more than its seven million. So it's got more than seven million coming in, which is fine, but it can only spend seven million, so there's a surplus. Um, on the 13th of June, both the reported the one million donation, you see that recorded in paragraph 14 of the Divisional Court Judgment. And as I said, absolutely nothing wrong with that, <coughs> but it couldn't spend that. So what Vote Leave decided to do was to donate some of its surplus funds to meet the referendum expense liabilities of another permitted participant whose aims, objectives aligned with its own, and that was Mr. Grimes. So that's the two permitted participants and how they relate to each other. Next, aggregate IQ called AIQ, was a Canadian company that specialised in online advertising. Well, um, we, we, we have the judgement. I, I assume the, the factual description in the judgement is, is uncontroversial. Yes, so it's 19. But the significance of it is, and this is again the... Uh, it gets back to the uh, common plan expenses. Um, What's important is the fact recorded in paragraph 19 of the judgment, mm -hmm. namely that between the 14th and the 21st of June, Mr. Grimes made four agreements with AIQ in which it agreed to provide advertising campaign in support of the leave outcome, and importantly, the invoices for that were submitted uh, to... Mr. Grimes slash B leave for those purposes. And that's the six twenty thousand dollars. It's on the assumed factual basis um, that there was no common plan expense involved. Um, on that basis, it was Mr. Grimes and only Mr. Grimes who incurred the six hundred and twenty thousand odd electoral expense in respect of the AIQ services. Our analysis is Mr. Grimes, Mr. Grimes alone incurred that expense. Specifically, both lead did not. And it's that analysis that was, uh, and only that analysis, that was given uh, permission to proceed by way of judicial review. And we see that, um, again, picked up in the final sentence of paragraph 22 of the judgment. 
So, no doubt, there is no doubt that under the agreement uh, with Mr. Grimes, the services that AIQ was to provide fell within and were captured by Part 1 of Schedule 13. So that aspect of the definition is satisfied. And we say as a matter of basic contract law, Mr. Grimes having made the agreements with AIQ for AIQ to provide services, Mr. Grimes incurred the liability for those services. Um, discharging that liability was an expense on his part. Um, and so returning to our definition at section 111, paragraph, sub subsection 2, we say it was incurred by him, Mr. Grimes, and satisfied all the requirements of that subsection. Our position is the fact that Vote for Leave was to meet Mr. Grimes' liability to AIQ didn't alter the fact that the only two parties to the agreements, those four agreements, were Mr. Grimes and AIQ, and it was under those agreements that AIQ provided the advertising services. AIQ invoiced Mr. Grimes, and only Mr. Grimes, and it was Mr. Grimes and only Mr. Grimes that incurred the liability for those advertising services. Nothing unlawful in what was done, and as the Divisional Court properly observed paragraph 23, we're not concerned with the motivations parties or the morality of their conduct. And there aren't, as such, anti-avoidance provisions in the uh, Act of the 2015 Act of the 2000 Act. The way it's dealt with is through the Common Plan Expenses Reporting Provisions. That is the way that it is dealt with. And as I say, uh, it was foreseen by the draftsman and the way um, the response to that um, issue was the common plan expenses provisions. Um, just to pick up the other side of the uh, equation, and that is um, that payment by vote leave discharge the liability was clearly a donation by vote leave to Mr. Grimes. It had to be reported as a donation by vote leave to Mr. Grimes and indeed it was reported as a donation by vote leave to Mr. Grimes. So that's the money in aspect of it. Um, and that is recorded by the Divisional Court in paragraph 95 of its judgment. So just pausing here, we've seen the way that it was done with both the uh, Mr. Grimes and AIQ, but it could have been done in other ways. Mr. Grimes, for example, if he had had £620,000, um, he could have used his £620,000 and both leave might have said, well, you've used up all your spare cash, here's 620,000 for my straight donation. Mr. Grimes would have discharged the liability from his own money, exactly the same as we have got here. Um, alternatively, both leave could have given Mr. Grimes 620,000 pounds. 620,000 pounds, Mr. Grimes decides he's going to discharge his liability to AIQ doesn't matter. The expense itself was incurred by Mr. Grimes. It was not incurred by Vote Leave. Instead, what they plumped for was that Vote Leave would pay AIQ directly. Um, and looked at it contractually, for example, AIQ hadn't been uh, paid by Mr. Grimes. Uh, they would have had a very difficult time trying to recover it, of course, from Vote Leave. They, contract was between them and Mr. Grimes, 
Mr Grimes uh, wasn't paid, um, didn't, if AIQ weren't paid, sorry, then they would have to chase Mr Grimes. They'd have no right to go against, um, no right to go against uh, Vote Lee. Mr Coppell, uh, again, I don't want to take you out of your flow at all, but at some point, Certainly, speaking of myself, I'd be assisted. If you could help me with this. Yeah. On the facts, as you've told us, it was vote leave which happened to be the donor. Yes? But, but it, would the divisional court's legal analysis uh, be equally applicable if the donor to Mr Grimes or somebody in Mr Grimes' position were just red blocks? Yes. Um, the fact of donation isn't altered by the fact that Vote League was a permitted participant or indeed was a designated organisation. Right. Anybody who donates to a permitted participant, the permitted participant has got to spell out, and of course most of them are just individuals. Well, let's, let's try, just try to follow that through and, and take it well away from these, these circumstances. Let's have a different referendum in mind, the one about uh, AV voting. Yeah. Okay. And um, as I understand the Divisional Court's judgment, if my Lord's Mr. Bloggs um, said to a, 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 a permitted um, person, well, I'll discharge, I want to give you £25,000, so more than the £10,000 limit. Sure. And what I'd like to do is just distar discharge your liability for the accommodation that you're occupying. And I'll do it direct. Now, on the, on, on the Divisional Court's analysis, as I understand it, um, that person, the £25,000 donor, um, would have incurred uh, election uh, expenses or referendum expenses and thus be dragged into the uh, reporting um, regime and discharging the liability in that way and failing to follow the regime gives rise to potential criminal liability. By contrast, if the donor just says, well, I want to give you £25,000, here it is, um, that, that, that's fine. And it, it may be, we, we'll look at precisely what the Divisional Court said, but um, let's again have our £25,000 hypothetical donor who is particularly interested in, I don't know, social media campaigning and says, well, um, I'm going to give you £25,000, but I'm interested in social media campaigning. Please spend it only on social media campaigning. And as I read the Divisional Court judgment, that would be court as well. Yes, they they draw a line between general and specific. Yes. And yes. that's the problem that it creates. And the example your Lordship has given is a good one, because what happens is, as I've said, donors themselves are not obligated to put in no. reports, mm. it's the recipient who reports, I have received this donation, it's the spender, the permitted participant, who reports this, it's not the donor, as it happened in this case, this was a donor which did have to yes. make its own mm. reports mm. of its own donations and its own expenditure, and so in a sense you could uh, slightly merge things. Yes, but but it, is, it is important, as it seems to, to, to me, that we need to a step well away, both from the the um, uh, identities of the, the 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 donor and so on in this in, in this case, and and think about how this plays generally in in referendums. And I know you're going to develop submissions about how it feeds into the other aspects of the re re regime. Um, and uh, it's, it's simply not uncommon for donors in elections uh, to discharge liabilities that have been incurred <coughs> by political parties, for or, example. It's very common indeed. Or even more common is for donors to make donations by providing facilities, by providing accommodation, yes. by providing <laughs> transport or what have you. And there are separate, there are, there's separate provisions which, which govern that, but, but which, which certainly... Which them in as, as being donations, no different from donations of money. The whole thing um, is skewed by we say, the decision of the Divisional Court. Well, we'll need, we'll, we'll need to but look at that and, and follow it through, perhaps. Um, if, 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 if my Lord will forgive, I, I, can I just add a supplementary question, which, which in due course, I think I would certainly benefit from the answer to. 
uh, if, say, it is an individual donor, and, 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 and let, let's, as my board says, let's, let's stay well away from the facts of this case. Let, if we want, we can, we, can, we can go to 2011 and the AV referendum if, if we want. Um, but Mr. Bloggs is an individual donor, and he, let's just say for the sake of argument, he gives a donation of £300,000. If that also constitutes the incurring of expenses, does that mean that the, the that requirement about the auditor kicks in? Yes, but not on him, on the, the recipient. So, Mox gives, right. oh, I want preferential voting. Let's say I'm, I'm yes. a preferential voting, I'm a committed participant in the AV referendum. I received from blogs £300,000. Mm. Up to this moment, all I've received in donations is £250. Great, I've received £350. I report the donation and I expend it on this, that, and the other. And as a result of that, I'm over the £250,000 threshold yeah, and a higher reporting requirement. But suppose the donor is doing it for a very specific purpose to discharge particular liabilities. Then does the donor become subject to the expenses regime? No, the, the donor is... Um, well, under the divisional court. Well, that, 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 under the divisional court, that, that, that's, yes. that's what test, forgive me, Mr. Coffin, what, what, what we're trying to test purposes. is what... No, yeah, I know your submission is different. What we're interested in testing is the divisional court's judgment and the possible consequences. Well, that, that the court has exactly what uh, the concern but, is on the Electoral Commission, is well, that it, it does bring in blogs, who's not necessarily a committed participant, and then blogs has to make a judgment on whether it fits into the divisional court assessment of general or specific, and so on and so forth. And a whole bundle of uh, reporting requirements, and let's not forget the sanctions that can be imposed. And that's just not how the regime works. But your, ba I mean, your basic submission, if I've understood it, is that if, if we carry on with Mr. Bloggs in the AV uh, referendum, he's not a permitted participant. So if he makes a donation of more than £10,000, which count as referendum expenses because he has specified the particular purpose for which it's donated or discharged a liability, then he is... Um, he has done so in contravention of the law because he's not a permitted participant. He's liable to criminal prosecution on that account. Um, and, and so that's the headline. Um, if he had been a part permitted participant and he failed to do all the reporting, then he would be liable to, to, to um, prosecution on a different basis. But it's perhaps, uh, it's perhaps best to try to, um, to test this against the donation from someone who is not a permitted participant, Certainly. because that, that sets up the dynamic. Yeah, there is an unusualness, greater. in a sense, of having one permitted mm. participant uh, yes. because of the surplus. But mm. yes, you can test, you can stress test the divisional uh, court judgment by reference to the donor who is not a permitted participant, unwittingly finding themselves in this highly regulated regime with, understandably, um, severe sanctions. And that's, we say, not how it's meant to work. It's you decide to become a committed participant, you register yourself as a committed participant, and with that, as I have said from the outset, comes responsibility. That isn't the case in relation to people making donations, whether they are small donations, middle donations, or big donations. It's the recipient on whom uh, the reporting requirement uh, rests. Um, so <coughs> Mr. Grimes, in this case, picking that up, um, had to report um, his uh, £620,000 liability to AIQ as if he had paid it off himself, um, whether or not he had received a donation, and that what he did. That's uh, recorded in the judgment. Sorry, my speaking at paragraph 50. Um, and um, the fact that 
liability to AIQ had been discharged by vote leave um, was highly relevant to whether it constituted a common plan expense and thus triggered the separate obligation on both vote leave and Mr Grimes to make declarations to that effect. And again, that's an important um, consideration is that where you've got common plan expenses, it's all the parties to the common plan that are under the obligation to report those common plan expenses. So a specific uh, set of provisions has been put in, in place in relation to that, and that's the additional uh, 4A and 4B to Section 120, effective by the 2015 Act. Um, the fact that it was a referendum expense incurred by Mr Grimes, although paid by AOQ, had another significance, and that is it absorbed the better part of his £700,000 spending limit. So the fact that vote leave discharged the liability didn't mean that Mr Grimes hadn't used up £620,000. He had used it up because he had incurred it. If he hadn't incurred it, he hadn't absorbed any of it. And we say um, that this, once you look at these uh, scenarios, whether it's this particular one or whether it's the apothecated examples in relation to the um, AV referendum, exposes the central weakness in the uh, divisional court judgment and indeed in the position of the respondents because at the heart of the reporting and spending limits of the regime is public accountability and keeping the permitted participants to the limits of their permitted referendum expenses. And other than where it is a common plan expense, where a particular expense is incurred for referendum purposes, it's no part of the regime, no part of the regime that the expense be double counted. And it's no part of the regime that a single expense should absorb more than one, the spending limits of more than one particip permitted participant. It isn't a common plan expense. There's only one permitted participant who can incur that. Um, and our point is that the regime is concerned to identify by or on whose behalf a referendum expense has been incurred and then to attach to that individual or body both the responsibility to report that expense and to use up that amount of the limit of the referendum expense permitted for that individual. And we say that goes to the heart of the single issue in this appeal. And that is whether in addition to being shown in Mr Grimes's various donation reports, Vote Leave, as well, should have included it in its statement under section uh, 120, subsection 2, paragraph A, as a referendum expense of its own. On the footing that it isn't a common plan expense, the answer to that is no. And the divisional court, I mean the respondents, in saying yes, um, are incorrect, and as we have already touched on, it yields the difficulty that the limits and the reporting requirements which have been carefully set both in the 2000 Act as mod and the modification of the 2015 Act results in those limits and the reporting requirement being skewed by what is effectively double reporting of single amounts referendum expenses that aren't common plan expenses. And far from assisting the respondent's case, the common plan expense provisions, which have their own separate re reporting requirements, as we've seen, empty the respondent's case of any policy justification. To introduce, as the divisional court has in its judgment, an implied additional requirement in the section 122A statement, something that's actually already dealt with.
in the Common Plan explains this declaration, the separate declaration. It's neither mandated by the legislation um, and indeed redraws um, the obligations carefully set by Parliament in the two Acts. The only explanation in the looks of the respondents' skeleton argument uh, is to fall back on the Common Plan expense provisions. Um, and similarly, we need to look at the way in which uh, this was dealt with by the Divisional Court, because again, um, we say fundamentally undermines the logic of the outcome. I've already indicated that in the Divisional Court judgment on the tap three and four bundle, there's a section uh, starting at paragraph 29, going down to 32, dealing with common plan expenses. <coughs> and as I've indicated, they are dealing with it on the footing that these weren't common plan expenses. And we then turn in the 2015 Act, which is under tab uh, 3, <coughs> to paragraph 22 of Schedule 1, page 186. And we see there the definition given to a common plan expense um, in paragraph, subparagraph two, sorry. And essentially, it is an expense that is incurred. I'm sorry, Mr. Capullo, I'm, I'm behind you. Give me the reference again, if you will. Page 186, paragraph yeah. 22. Thank you. Thanks. definition there in subparagraph 2, common plan expenses. It's essentially, to put it in neutral terms, it's an expense incurred by A in pursuance of a plan or other arrangement with B, or other letters of the alphabet, the view to promoting or procuring a particular outcome in relation to the question asked in the referendum. A common objective, they've got a plan or arrangement white words, and paragraph, uh, subparagraph 3 sets out the usual uh, position in relation to common plan expenses, and what it does is it brings that into the calculation of B, in my example, so that's not incurred by B, it's incurred by A, in the calculation of B's referendum expenses, whatever they be. That's what um, 117 and 118 are directed to is those, those limits. And are these reported separately? So again, just, just leave, leave, leave these individuals aside. Yeah. You've got a permitted participant. And would that permitted participant report the referendum expenses incurred by or on its behalf and then separately report the common plan expenses. Exactly. And you see that, the foot of that, page 187, in 4A and 4B, well, it's actually 23.2, mm -hmm. where it's inserting further, not a statement, but declarations. And the nature of those declarations are 4A and 4B, the foot of page 187. 23.4. It's paragraph 23. Paragraph 23. Yeah. Subparagraph 2. Yes. You, if you, uh, no, I, I have that. I, I, keep your it. hand at that. Turn to 120. You see what it's doing is it's saying not just the statement you, you see at subsection 120, 120 subsection 2. Turn to that, which is that. Why was that? Divisional Court, we had copies of the legislation with it all inserted so you could see it consolidated. Oh, that might be and quite I useful. Brought them, I brought them in case, because it's actually quite difficult, I found. Um, but I mean, you may not want to use them now, but you may want to use them later. Thank you. So, 
tricky initially to understand, but it has both without and with in that context. Well, thank you. But just to pick it up, um, <coughs> at 147, you see... Sorry, hey, page, page 147. Yes, this you. is the 2000 <coughs> section 120, subsection 2. A return under this section must specify the referendum to which the expenditure relates. It must contain A, respecting the long payments, B, C, D, which we've already looked at. And then you flip back to page 187, and it has added, after C, it's added C, A, C, B, declaration and declaration. What are the declarations? The declarations are 4A and 4B, which we're going to look at in a moment because they're complicated. But essentially they say, I was party to a common plan expense and I paid the amount. Or I was party to a common plan expense, I didn't pay the amount, X paid the amount. And X was also a party to it, and this is what it's for. So it's making absolutely clear to the outside world, these are common plan expenses, these are the parties to the plan, this is what it's for. This person paid the money or incurred the expense, but this one, as it were, enjoyed the benefit because it was done under a plan. And that's how... So it, 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 your submission is that, that that achieves transparency because it's, it's very clear who has been spending what. And a, a, a point, no doubt, of, of interest at the time was to be able to see how much was spent in total on each side of the argument. And by stripping it out in that way, you can get the total very easily. If, if you've got double reporting, then uh, no doubt if you buried yourself in, 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 in all of the invoices and so forth, you could work it out. That's what you would have. That's the only way you would be able to do it. This is, we say, a clear way of understanding what are the actual expenses incurred by or on behalf of one committed participant. And on the other hand, if the committed participant has been party to a common plan and, as it were, Enjoyed the benefit of expenditure by somebody else in the common plan, that too needs to be the subject of the report with a separate declaration. I think that what's said against you is that the underlying policy objective is not only one of transparency, uh, it is in relation to donations, but in relation to expenses, there's also a policy of limiting the expenditure. We're going to get to that right. in a moment, and we can see in particular how it is dealt with. So what happens is there is a, when it comes to common plan expenses, mm. there is a uh, attribution to either one or both of the parties of a common plan expense. So they don't wriggle out of it by making it part of the plan, and there are special requirements in relation to a designated organisation. So just to in the sense, jump ahead of myself. We are a designated organisation. As I indicated at the outset, you get the benefit of 700, 7 million expenditure, you get the benefit of a possible donation, you get the benefit of use of um, rooms and what have you. But with those comes um, greater responsibility, not just in reporting, when it comes to common plan expenses, it doesn't matter who's um, spent the money, it gets all shot home to the designated organisation. So I've said, you can have the greater limit, but don't think you can go beyond that greater limit by engaging in common plan expenses. And that, that, that's your fundamental submission, isn't it? That insofar as Parliament had that policy objective, that the overall limit should not be exceeded, it's catered for it by the common plan provisions. If you're not within the common plan provisions, as the divisional court assumed on the facts we were not, then, then what's your submission? That, that, that there's no underlying policy objective? No. Because, less? by definition, if it's not a common plan expense, mm. it's only an expense incurred by or on behalf of that committed participant that falls to be recorded. So, what is one left with that is, as it were, falling outside the the limit 
it is an expense that's not a common plan expense that hasn't been incurred by or on behalf of the party. And What's that going to be? But, but I think it said, it, I may not have understood the argument, forgive me, forgive me, but I, I think what could be said against you is it has been, it has been incurred on behalf of, it may not have been incurred by, but it has been incurred on behalf of. Because if it's on behalf of, hmm. then it is captured. Hmm. Yes, well, well that, that's your fundamental point, isn't it? That, that there isn't, there's no, you, you there's say, nothing gets through the, the, the yeah, system, yeah. Nice. we say. Yeah. It covers everything. Hmm. Uh, we don't need, we say, the divisional court. Um, <coughs> addition to the regime. So, um, I mentioned uh, before we were looking at paragraph 22. In the schedule to the 15 the Act. Page 186, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, that's the, uh, the way it's put by the heading is expenses incurred by persons acting in concert, and they're called common plan expenses as we will see. And as I foreshadowed, where one of the bodies in our common plan, I'll call A and B, just to neutralise this, is a designated organisation, I believe was, um, such as to satisfy um, one of the paragraphs uh, in uh, 22.5, then what happens is that the attribution provision, which we see in paragraph 3, is displaced by 5, so that the three sorts of expenses listed in A, B, and C in 5 are all brought into the calculation of only the designated organisation's referendum expense. Yeah. So this is, as I've said, one of the quid pro quos for your greater referendum expense limit is you get attributed to you all of the expenses of a common plan expense and not to any of the other organisations. So it's a displacement of uh, one uh, paragraph, subparagraph three. Subparagraph three, if you, not our situation because Vote League was designated organisation. <coughs> if you weren't, what it does is it says that both lots, if you want to go in, if you want to engage in common plan expenses, so far as your limits are concerned, it's going to both of your limits. Both of you are going to have to record them. The, the whole amount. Whole amount. So you've got a common plan expense, let's say, of £100,000. It's spent by A pursuant to common plan with B. As far as limits are concerned, it absorbs A, it absorbs A's limit to 100,000, and it absorbs B's limit to 100,000 as well. So it's fictional, it's a D, if you like, for its common plan expense. And again, that's to, uh, the policy behind that is to remove the attraction of um, doing things through common plan expenses in order to circumvent the limits themselves. So then the reporting of these common plan expenses, as I've already foreshadowed, is in paragraph 23 of Schedule 1, page 187. And as I've indicated, um, it inserts C, A, and C, B into subsection 2 and the uh, provisions of 4A. 4A is a declaration to be made by the committed participant that didn't actually incur the expense, but is party to that common plan expense, it has to make a discrete declaration in its return, separately identify all of the other individuals and bodies in the common plan and the amount of the common plan expense. 4B is a declaration made by the committed participant that did incur the referendum expense, and it has to put that not just in its um, section 122a statement, but also in its 4b um, separate declaration. And um, I make the point 
that these provisions, the declaration, the separate declaration provisions, uh, didn't feature, um, or didn't, weren't expressly referred to in the judgment of the divisional court. Now that's possibly because they were proceeding on the assumed basis of both the explanation. But looking at the legislative canvas and the policy push that drove the divisional court um, to do what it did, we say it should have been um, part of that um, conspectus of provisions considered by it. And then turn to the divisional court judgment. So that's my survey of the provisions. Um, which are hard going, but it's important and we move more easily thereafter. Um, so it's uh, tap three in the core bundle. And um, so the central issue is in paragraph 27 of their judgment, page 23 of the core bundle. And paragraph 40, sorry, 33, they begin a heading statutory interpretation. <coughs> Open the page, uh, starting at 36, the competing um, interpretations, and obviously uh, at that point, both the was making submissions. And well, we, ha we have a skeleton argument from both leave, even though they're not here still, which yes, we will... Which we will I'm not sure of the status of that because I had understood. Um, I don't know. Where, I, I, I received a copy, but I'd understood afterwards that there was questions whether, in fact, that was meant to go in. But I say no more about it. I, we were told it was dropped, and indeed I hadn't addressed it in the statement. So we never knew that it had gone into the court. But I'm, well, not, I'm, I'm not bothered. We, we've got it, yeah. and. To the extent that it that it makes arguments that we need to think about, we'll think about them. <laughs> we see in the judgment um, at paragraph forty one, essentially the divisional court accepted the respondents' interpretation, which they summarise in paragraph thirty six. I am so sorry. I do have to interrupt at this point. I've skipped red from paragraph 67 onwards of this note. Yes. And it appears that a ground of appeal is being argued that is not uh, a ground of appeal in this case, and that we haven't stressed that it would be, it was the central argument in the court below, but was not appealed. Uh, and many of my arguments I've made on the assumption that this has all been accepted. Be, uh, so, what do you mean in a sentence? What is this, the point? Because we've not read ahead. Okay. So, uh, the, the grounds of appeal do not challenge the, um, the divisional court's finding in relation to the incurring of an expense in section 111 or in respect of a referendum expense in paragraph 1, schedule 13. Those are two issues that are determined by the divisional court. And if we go to the grounds of appeal... Well, we'll I, I, just, just pause for a moment. I think... Um, if this is if this is new material that we're we're not we haven't yet heard, um, can we just can we just pause and see um, what Mr. Coppel wishes to do with it, and then if there is an issue, we'll um, we'll uh, deal with it then. Yes, it's quite it's quite difficult, Miss Simon, at least for me, to un understand a res your response to an argument that I haven't yet heard, and I'm not sure quite how it's going to come. Yes, my lord, I just I just do want to lay down a marker. Was, as I said below, a large part of the hearing was taken up by this argument, which we have not addressed at all. All right. Thank you. The authority is not used here. Um, so, ordinary meaning, paragraph 41, you see that the division court says, as a matter of ordinary English usage, and they look at the purpose they call the phrase, as a composite phrase, expenses incurred is, we apprehend, most naturally understood in the broad sense intended for by the claimant, it's natural to describe a person as having incurred an expense whenever he or she has spent money or incurred a liability, which in either case reduces his or her financial resources. And that reference to um, broad sense intended by the claimant is a reference to the summary which they um, provide of 
the then claim now respondent's argument in paragraph 36, i.e., you in expenses incurred, and it's important to note that it's a composite phrase, expenses incurred, so it's not just a single word, um, is any outflow, they say, of economic benefit. And um, we say, um, just dividing the phrase um, in two, and it is a composite phrase, um, expenses incurred, uh, the verb, we say, uh, colours the meaning of expenses. And we say that to say a person has necessarily incurred an expense merely because the person has spent money um, is not to understand the true meaning of the word incur as it modifies um, the word expenses. Incur, just look that rawly, means to bring on oneself. Can you bring on yourself an expense? Uh, Co-located with the word expenses, or you can bring on yourself an obligation. But whether it's expenses incurred or whether it's an obligation um, which is incurred, it connotes a responsibility for that expense, for that obligation. So that if, for example, money is donated to B, A donates money to B, A does not bring an expense on him or herself. And we say that the divisional court, in looking at this composite phrase, expenses incurred, gave the term incurred an expansive meaning that goes well beyond its ordinary meaning. And the example one can give, I give £10 to a person who's hungry on the street, begging me for help. Um, I'm not incurring an expense in any normal lexicon by giving that person £10. Um, um, and in each of these cases, yes, I am diminishing my assets, but on no normal sense can that be characterised as an expense incurred by me. Now, it is the case, of course, it's the case quite common, that where A agrees with B for B to provide A with goods or services, the moment of payment for those services is coincident with the provision of the goods or the services. Um, and you still say, nevertheless, in that situation that the expense is incurred even though the moment of exchange of goods and the payment is coincident. That's not what matters. It is, as I've said, um, bringing on to oneself an expense that is meant by incur expense. Yeah, I'm not sure I necessarily thought of that. Why is it contrary to common sense to say if you give £10 to a homeless person that you've spent that money? Not that you've spent that money, that you've incurred an expense. So, so you say that's the critical thing. This isn't, this isn't just a reflection of the fact that you get income coming in and expenditure going out. It's not as simple as that. You say there's some particular meaning which needs to be attached to the phrase expenses incurred. Is that right? The, the two things are, are concatenated and they colour each other. Um, expenses incurred. <coughs> so um, if one were to say that, for example, somebody is subject to a spending limit, you, you, would you submit that one needs to be careful? Because that's not actually what's happened. It's a limit on expenses incurred. Is that right? The, the point we're making here, and bear in mind we say, remember it picks up incurred by or on behalf. So yes. that opens things out. Yes. It is... Um, an expense incurred by the individual is not simply A pays money to B, um, where B has no obligation to give A anything, no. where there's no return, so it's not pursuant to agreement, a mere donation. No, but you spent it. Surely if you, have, if you have a certain amount of money in your pocket in a week, you've got £100. Right? You, if you, spe pounds. Yeah, you spend one, one evening, you spend £10 on a meal, Next evening, you give ten pounds to a homeless person. At the end of the week, your budget 
the money you've got to spend has been diminished. Correct. So, so why, why can't it be said, as a matter of ordinary meaning at least, I think you, you, I think you accept, it can be said that you have spent the £10. You can say yeah. I've spent it. Right, you I'm accept that. Yeah. All right. that. Okay, but you say that somehow that's not the same as an expense incurred. Correct. Right. I see. And indeed, if that's what the legislature would want to say, money spent, that's what the legislature would have said. And you'll recall that um, when I opened, I said, this is a turn of phrase, expenses incurred, which you see peppered throughout this Act, which you see peppered throughout the RPA, and has been with our uh, legislation, um, electoral legislation, for over 150 years. Um, and we'll look at the, the one authority that we will look at, um, in fact, underscores this meaning. Um, that it is, in the ordinary sense, not just the money going out of your, happens to go out of your pocket, um, it is the incursion of an expense, it's reciprocity between payer and recipient. So, to move away from the shopping examples to the referendum expenses regime, we say the same principle applies, that if both need had made a donation to Mr. Grimes before any mention of AIQ, and then AI, and then later Mr. Grimes had made his four agreements with AIQ incurring the liability, and then using that money that both need had donated to Mr. Grimes, you couldn't say that both need had incurred that expense to AIQ. Transactionally, money has gone out of both leaves pockets. It's gone to Mr. Grimes. Mr. Grimes has used that money to discharge the liability. But leave hasn't incurred the expense. And that is the case whether AIQ was on the horizon when both leave made the payment to Mr. Grimes, or whether it wasn't on the horizon when it made the payment to Mr. Grimes. And the same is true if it circumvents that and simply pays off. Mr. Grimes' liability to, uh, to AIQ. So, Mr. Cottle, going back to, to your £10 example to the homeless person, you would say there's no reciprocity there? No, I don't expect anything from no, the homeless person. Precisely that. So, I'm not incurring an no. expense. I'm donating money, mm. I might say, to them, just giving the money to the individual. I don't want anything back. On the divisional court judgment, uh, if, if, if uh, I may have misunderstood them, if, if they were construing expenses incurred simply to mean spent, which they are, the, to your submission is that's how they construed it, right? That is how that, they construed it. Right. If, that, if that's right, then on their construction, why would there be any distinction between what they call the general and specific donation? Because surely on their construction, if you give £10 to the homeless person, You've spent it, and therefore that must be an expensive. It's the tying to the tying to the referendum, so it's looking not just at the expense incurred. Remember, in section one or one, yes. subsection two, mm. that it has to be tied to the purpose. So they were concerned with, as they saw it, making a distinction between where A gives B. Here's a hundred thousand. Off you go. Make do what you like with it. Um, that didn't have what might be termed the nexus with referendum expenses. And but isn't, is, yes, but because the, the, the problem is um, there's a permitted participant who wants money to pursue its aim in the referendum. And a, 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 a donor says, well, I'm happy to give you a £100,000. Although the list of things that count as referendum expenses um, is, is closed, um, it's rather difficult to imagine that the donor is giving the £100,000 other than to enable the permitted participant to spend it as referendum expenses. I mean, what else would it be spent on is, is the question that's been running through my mind. And, and so, as my Lord says, the distinction... Um, 
is, is one that what, what I think one we will we'll need a, a clear explanation of how it arises. I appreciate there's no sign of it in the in the legislation, but that's a different point. It's really if a donor let's say gave vote leave half a million pounds, what was vote leave to do with it other than spend it in the referendum campaign pursuing its agenda and ditto the 122 other permitted participants who uh, were were uh, floating around at the time. Well, there is that difficulty. I think to be uh, fair to the divisional court, they touch on this in paragraph 44, mm. um, where they say, nevertheless, we would not go so far as to say that as a matter of language, the phrase expenses incurred, so no nexus issue, is incapable of being used in the narrowest sense intended by both leave such that only a sum which a person becomes liable to pay, typically by the making of a contract, is to be regarded as an expense incurred by that person. We accept that if other indications of legislative intention point strongly in that direction, the phrase could be construed in this sense. Well, um, this is just what we say the problem is um, with this. It is a and, yes. fuzzy, fuzzy. And the, the, the position in a referendum is obviously rather different from the position in ordinary elections where one has political parties, because if, if, if somebody wishes to give £100,000 to a political party, um, the political party, at, at least if the gift isn't, isn't, isn't with strings attached, can spend it in the election campaign, or if they don't need to spend it in the election campaign, it goes into the into the reserves, but that's not the position in the referendum. No, um, um, certainly not for those other than the, uh, the parties themselves. So the, the way the uh, divisional court structured its, um, its analysis of the legislation was to, as I said, set out the interpretation, set out what it said was the ordinary meaning of the words, which we just looked at, then it looks, starting at paragraph 45, page 27 of the core bundle, at the meaning given in other contexts, and it rejects the idea that any assistance uh, can be gathered from its meaning as used um, in other electoral legislation. You see that in 46. That seems to have featured strongly in, by counsel for both leave. Um, and we say that itself, is surprising um, because the two acts, <coughs> the 2000 Act, the 2013 well, Act, the 2000 Act, the 2015 Act, and the Representation of the People Act 1983 um, dovetail with one another, and you see peppered throughout the 2000 Act references to the 1983 Act. They're dealing with the same subject matter and they deal with it on the same or similar lines. And we say that they are to be construed consistently, if possible. Um, and the general rule in this area is that if you're dealing with um, a subject matter that is common, it is generally to be assumed that Parliament intends that the later legislation to be construed in light of and consistent with the early registration, in other words, 1983. And this is relevant because the issue of A paying B's expenses is what I term an old chestnut in election law. For over 150 years, there have been provisions in our election legislation dealing with election expenses. And if you turn to um, the relevant provisions of the RPA, which are in tab 2. So now I'm saying... One. Is it tab 1? Tab 1. Uh, oh, sorry, tab 1. Yes, correct. If you turn to page 27... Expenses. 
to subsection 4, we'll see that it's the same turn of phrase, expenses incurred by or on behalf of the candidate, obviously reflecting it being an election rather than a referendum, by the candidate or his agent, by any other person. Now this finds its way in various other provisions of the RPA itself. And we say that when one comes up with a meaning of expenses incurred, one's got to see how that meaning is going to work its way through, not just in the numerous other provisions of the RPA, of the uh, 2000 Act, but also in the RPA. And the only authority that one can find in this area, and I, I understand it wasn't referred to below, is the Cockermouth Division case of 1901 in O'Malley and Hare's election reports, which we have um, have for the authorities bundle. Now, to ex explain, these are a set of reports that were devoted to election cases that came out for a period of years after the great Victorian electoral legislation reforms and then they stopped uh, being produced. But it, this case concerns a return of a candidate's election expenses and it's a provision that um, we still see in the RPA, it's now in section 81. And what that requires, what the current regime, what the old regime requires is that not more than 35 days after the declaration of the result of an election, each candidate's agent has to deliver to the returning officer a return containing for that candidate a statement of all election expenses incurred, expenses incurred by or on behalf of the candidate. So very similar phraseology to section 111 subsection 2 of the 2000 Act. And here, the relevant facts very shortly state that page 156, the second side note, we see that it was proved that the respondent, that's a Mr. Randalls, was selected as a candidate on the 2nd of April 1900. The election took place on the 14th of October 1900, on the 20th of September, so that's within the period of the election. A tea meeting provided by the Liberal Unionist Association took place, the expenses of which were defrayed by that association, but were not returned by the respondent in his return of expenses. So here you have um, benefit, tea room, being provided by a person to the candidate, and he's not put it in his return of expenses. Mr. Justice Darling says this at the foot of that page, page 156, as, a matter, as to the matter of the Liberal Unionist tea, if those were expenses incurred on account of or in respect of the conduct or the management of the election, then an offence was committed because they were not paid by or through the agent of Mr. Randalls. Then I do not think that those expenses were incurred in respect of the conduct or management of the election. So, this judge is making the point that the association had arranged to have the tea party sometime before the, um, the event itself. And it seems that Mr. Randalls um, just went to the tea party, gate crash perhaps, to help his election campaign. So he gets out that way. But what he is saying is, but for that, even though it's supplied by the Liberal Unionist Party, it would have been an expense incurred by Mr. Randalls. So the analogy here is Liberal Unionists like Vote Leave, providing the facility to AIQ, and Mr. Randalls is the equivalent of Mr. Grimes. It would have had to have been reported uh, by Mr. Grimes had it been, in a sense, connected. But the point is better made over the page, page 100. 58 by the other Justice, Justice Chanel, at the top of that page, 
where he says the difference between an act done for the conduct of management of the election and a thing done merely for the promotion of the success of a particular candidate seems to be this. If another person pays an expense, and that expense is one of the ordinary expenses of a candidate, so that the doing of that act by the third person relieves the candidate from part of his election expenses, then the candidate must treat that expense as given to him in respect of his election expenses and must treat the expense as part of his expenses. And that, we say, is the correct analysis. Um, but the issue that has arisen in the present context was simply not on its facts, the issue in that case, was it? The question was never, uh, no, the, it only gives somebody, whether it's part no, of their expenses. The, the expense itself in that case was, they were already going to have their tea party. Um, so that's why Mr. Randalls didn't fall foul of the reporting requirement. It's not as if they decided they're going to have a tea party to assist Mr. Randalls. Had they had the tea party to assist Mr. Randalls, then it would have been reported by Mr. Randalls as an expense incurred by him. But I understand, but, but does, how does it help this court in, in, in answering the question the divisional court was answering, which is whether a donation can, in certain circumstances, also be an expense incurred? Well, we say that what it demonstrates, and it's the only authority on this expenses incurred in a, uh, whether in an election context or a referendum expense, uh, context, is that if it is an election expense, or if it is a referendum expense, albeit one which is paid by another person, the person who's incurred the expense is Candidate, Mr. Randalls in this case, or it's Mr. Grimes in the case of the... But I don't understand that, but the proposition you have to establish, I think, is that that is the only person who has incurred the expense. Yes, but... Um, and they, were, they weren't addressing that question, were they? Yes, they were addressing that question also concerned with, with the treaty, because there were obvious provisions um, with concerns about providing drink and what have you. Um, in relation to that, if that throws up the fundamental point I've raised by Justice Burnett, namely, why does it suddenly change? Because in this case, the person making the donation was a participant, and thereby under reporting obligations, whereas if it had been, let's say, by the um, Liberal Unionist Tea Party, Tea whatever it is, organisation, it wouldn't be because it was a, wasn't a political participant. And this is why the whole thing, we say, goes awry. Um, and it does arise in a subtle way in the, um, in the Cockermouth decision, because in election law, the only person who can incur expenses in support of a candidate is the candidate or is through the candidate's agent. You would have had a difficulty if the Liberal Unionist um, organisation would have had a difficulty had it been seen as being a payment by them. That would have brought them within the terms of the petition itself. So it's, it arises, in a sense, by not being an issue in that case. Yes, I see. If, if that makes the point. It, it does, thank you. Um, so <coughs> then <coughs> we're looking at the uh, judgment we've seen other contexts and then at page 28 of the core bundle it's in the divisional court judgment uh, paragraph 49 under the heading incurring paying and contracting they start to analyse those terms uh, before concluding at the end of that section that they can't get very much out of those terms because they see them as being consistent with both the interpretations that were being put before it. Um, and uh, again, we make the point um, that so far as referendum expenses are concerned, um, there, can, there needs to be uh, a distinction between the mere payment and the incurring of an expense, and that is implicit in the provisions to which they refer. Um, if we then go back to 
the RPF, uh, the um, 2000 then, sorry. Tab 2. say that it is apparent from those provisions that as regards referendum expenses, um, there can only be a payment of referendum expenses that have been incurred or are to be incurred. You can simultaneously have a payment of a referendum expense at the moment of incursion. And it may be made by the same person that incurred the election expense, but as an activity of uh, incurring a referendum expense, is distinct from paying for a referendum expense incurred. And we see that implicit, um, we say, in subsection 1 of 114 of 115. Then, in the judgment of the divisional court, got to the end of their heading of three words, they start a, a section dealing with expenses and donations. Um, and paragraph 58 is important to their analysis because in there, page 31, they conclude <coughs> they do not think it possible to deduce from the scheme or the text or the purpose of the legislation that the same transaction can never constitute both the making of a donation and the incurring of a referendum expense. Indeed, had that been the intention, might also reasonably be expected that the legislation would say so in terms. Well, the point I've been making is that the legis legislation does say so in terms. It's carefully um, and expressly differentiated a transaction where A donates money to B, permit participant, for the purpose of B meeting referendum expenses. That's the section 119 schedule 15 scheme money in from the transaction where B, or someone on B's behalf, incurs a referendum expense, and that's the regime in sections 111 to 118. The way I put it is the first is concerned with money in, the second is concerned with money out, both of them um, get reported, and we say it is unhelpful to confuse uh, the two here. And hence we have in our case, the example of A donating money to B, which B uses to meet referendum expenses, that B has incurred, A here being vote leave, uh, Mr. Grimes has to report the donation made to him, Mr. Grimes separately has to report the fact that he has incurred election expenses, um, in, sorry, referendum expenses. Um, and the difficulty which is created by the divisional court regime uh, is that if it is correct that where A donates money to B to meet a liability to X, if that can represent a referendum expense incurred by A, it's like common expenses, does it mean that since A has incurred the expense, necessarily B hasn't incurred the expense? Can both A and B incur an expense which isn't a common plan expense? Um, and the court recognised that under the heading double reporting, paragraph 60 down to 64, but concludes at 64, we see no objection in principle to an analysis which is the consequence that two committed participants may each incur referendum expenses in connection with the same purchase of goods or services. Well, we have difficulty with that. We have great difficulty with that. Um, and first of all, um, you then have to start differentiating or distinguishing amongst donations 
some donations are going to be captured as expenses incurred by the donor, while others aren't. And pausing here, this is, we say, fundamentally anathema to electoral legislation. Electoral legislation, as I said at the outset, doesn't like having these grey areas. It is as far as possible letting people know exactly what has to be done, prescribing in minute detail what has to be done, and not leading to judgments where people can fall foul and find themselves suffering penalties because they have got it wrong. And this idea that, well, you can make a payment to X, which is discharging a liability to B, this may or may not be um, something which you have to report. It depends on, really, this uh, subtle difference which the um, Divisional Court has, uh, has drawn between general and, and specific uh, donations. And that flies, I say, in the face of principle, the principle um, that surrounds the ter interpretation of election legislation. Secondly, quite apart from that, uh, we say it matters very much that a single payment of referendum expenses, which isn't a common plan expense, is reported uh, twice. Um, it's not a question of reporting the same money as a donation by the donor and as a referendum expense by the donee, which is what the uh, Divisional Court referred to in paragraph 62. That's perfectly possible. It was the case here. The problem is that if a donation is treated as a referendum expense by the donor, as well as a referendum expense by the donee, then that single referendum, uh, sorry, that single donation is going to twice absorb the referendum expense limits if they're both permitted participants. And it also means as a member of the public goes through the uh, reports that are put in by the parties and tops up the total referendum expenses incurred by all of those advocating one side or the other, they're going to be given a false figure. And then finally, <coughs> the divisional court, what we say, didn't give consideration to section 161 concerned with donations and it's concerned with donations that are designed to secure that a person does not incur an expense. If we look at subsection 3, it's a clear legislative indication that where A spends money out of A's own resources, no right of reimbursement, in paying expenses incurred by B, that is to be treated as a donation from A to B. The payment uh, by A takes away from the fact that the expense has been incurred by B. Sorry, it does not take away the fact that the expense is incurred by B. And if the division was called for were correct, um, since the payment by A would be in respect of an expense incurred by A, the deemed donation, which is effectively created by section 161, would cease to be. Finally, I, 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 I've not read this section before, so I just... Um, <clears throat> what it's trying to do is deal with donations in a sort of roundabout way from A to B. says that, for example, in the example we have before us, um, 1613 treats the money paid by Vote Leave to AIQ as a donation to Mr. Grimes. Yes. 
get to the end of the analysis of the judgment. So picking up um, looking at the various uh, provisions as a reference to legislative purpose, starting in paragraph 73 down to 79. And then we see the um, consideration of general and specific donations. <coughs> and at paragraph 80, a general donation, they tell us, is a gift of money made to a permitted participant to be used in whatever way the recipient chooses in seeking to prom promote a particular outcome of the referendum. Uh, such a donation, they say, will be an expense incurred um, by the donor for referendum expenses, um, but the expense won't be incurred in respect of a matter falling within Part 1 of Schedule 13. So that's the way they deal. It is an expense incurred, but it's, it slips out because of um, Paragraph um, 1 of Schedule 13. Um, then the second and, uh, deals with what they call a specific donation. Um, and they say there are three limbs to this. Uh, and that is a specific, specific donation will capture money, one, paid directly by the donor <coughs> by agreement with the donor to discharge a liability of the donee to pay for goods and services falling within part of the 13. Well, that wasn't here. Two, money paid pursuant to an agreement to pay or reimburse the donee for the cost of such goods or services purchased by the donee. Or three, money given on terms, binding on the donee, that is to be used for the purchase or to pay for particularly qualifying goods or services. Um, and in any one of those three situations, the expenses incurred in making such a specific donation, they say, fall to be regarded as incurred in respect of a matter within part uh, 1 of Schedule 13 of um, the Act and hence a referendum expenses. Um, okay, so I'm now going to look at the scenarios. It's going to take a bit of time. Is well, it convenient? It, it is a convenient moment, but we, we need just to have a, a think about time um, because we've got to hear from Miss um, Simer. I appreciate that it's unlikely that we'll need to be taken um, quite, quite, in quite such detail through the legislation. But um, uh, how much longer do you do you think you're going to be? Thirty, forty minutes. Well, I think we better we better we better say thirty. May, may I just clarify one thing? <coughs> yes. My learned friend said in relation to eighty-one that it was not category one that we were dealing with, and I understood uh, the appellant's case to be that it is number one. It seems, it, it seems to be a description of what actually happened, but, but let's, let, let's take that up at 2 o'clock. Thank you.